So hi, um, I'm Konstantin. This is going to be a super improvised lecture. So actually this lecture was meant to be cancelled and just because of a communication issue in the lab internally this message never reached you. So basically we got a call yesterday, hey prepare like a quick lecture. So Chris and I will exactly do that. So um, I will talk a little bit about deep learning, some deep learning fundamentals and uh, branch off into graph convolutional networks because this is kind of a nice topic that we investigated recently um, with some pitfalls. So you're going to learn when you can apply this and when you can't, which is quite important. So. First, some basics about deep learning. Now, um, since you are bioinformaticians, I assume not that many people did actually do something with 2D confnets or deep learning in general. Um, can I have a show of hands who did something with 2D convolutional neural networks? Okay, two guys. So it makes sense to go into a bit more depth here. So. Um, this is basically a classical traditional CNN. This is kind of the first very popular incarnation of CNNs. Uh, this was usually done on image data or well basically data on a grid. This is one of the preconditions for, for convolutional neural networks. And basically what we did was we just used convolutional filters to create feature maps and we did this in an iterative process. So we are compressing these feature maps down, making them a little bit smaller, then using another set of convolutions to create even more feature maps, uh, making them even smaller and so on and so on. And at some point we go into a fully connected layer and well do a classification or whatever we are going to going to do here with that system. Now um, it's important to understand how these convolution kernels actually work. So this looks a bit complicated but I'm going to walk you through this. So this here is the input of our layer. This input has three feature channels. So this is uh, it's a tensor of 7 times 7 times 3. 3 is the depth dimension. So for example for images you could imagine these are the R and G and B channels. Okay? So this is one way to look at it and these would be kind of pixel values for each of these color channels. This is one way to look at it. Now what we do with a convolution filter is first we have to decide what kind of size does it have. Um, in this case it's a 3 by 3 filter. And the depth dimension is implicitly given because it's always the same as the input. Such a convolution filter always runs through the full depth of our input that we have. Then on each position here we have a weight. This, these are the trainable parameters for this convolution kernel. And we move this convolution kernel across the full input image. Basically all possible positions. And we multiply with these weights and sum up and this is what's going to come out in the output feature map. Now the important part here with this convolution filter is these weights are always going to be the same no matter where I place this on my input. And this is important because this means it's translation invariant. This is usually what we want. For example, if you're feeding in an image of some animals, you're trying to detect a cat, then the system shouldn't only detect the cat when it's in a certain position in the image, it should detect the cat no matter where it is in the image. This is exactly what these convolution filters do. Yes? But that means that our kernel size is big enough to encompass completely or entirely the thing that we're trying to find? Not necessarily, not necessarily, because it's not the, it's like, this is the point of deep learning that you stack multiple layers. So what you get in the end is a certain receptive field, what we call it. And this is kind of a combination of the filter sizes that you use throughout the full network. So you might use a combination of filters with size 3 by 3 and this is enough to actually get to a receptive field, like the total field that these kernels see of, depending on the layers, could be 20 by 20 or even more, much more, or even the full input. That's, that's just the effect of stacking multiples of those. Because in the end you get some output feature map, in this case it's 3 by 3, it could be larger. Then you're applying another set of kernels on this one here again. And what it does is basically, you could imagine in the first layer it only detects very simple geometric details like border lines where, where there's a large skip in color or brightness value for example. So it only detects that in the first layer and then in the next layer it's going to do some more abstraction. It's combining, well I saw a line like this somewhere and I saw another line like that and then the second layer of the CNN detects these combinations. So the information that these filters detect gets more and more abstract the further you go down. This is the idea behind it. This is the core concept even of deep learning. Um, what's that? Yeah. Understand? Well, the, then the next question would be, so then if you kind of train it to see straight lines or so, so very, very basic features that it then later abstracts to bigger concepts like cats, dogs or whatever, mm -hmm. how does it handle different zooms of things? Because if you, if, because a, a straight line, if, if a cat fits into an entire 3x3 three three box in one, mm -hmm. and another 
now it's just like the very edge of the face, mm -hmm. how would it be able to see both at the same time with the same filters? If the capacity of the network is high enough, it would simply learn to do that. It will combine simple features and... One for an entire cat within the box. Yeah, entire cat. This would be the very last thing, the very last thing in the layers. Okay, so the last layer would basically make this decision, is there a cat or is there no cat? And everything else before that is, well, less abstracted information. Yeah, but what if you have a cat that's so small in your picture that it fits in within an entire kernel? That could become difficult, depends. Some networks might be able to pick something up there, but yeah, like massive differences in scale would be kind of difficult to detect, depending on the architecture, how deep it is, how much capacity it has. Yeah, that's true. It is mostly translation invariant. This is the main feature of a CNN. It's, for example, also not rotation invariant. This would be one problem. So if you have cats upside down all the time, then suddenly network might not be able to detect that. And this is exactly one of the motivations for graph convolutional networks because they are kind of invariant to all kinds of, like, pretty much any affine transformation. Isn't that also sometimes not good because the spatial uh, information is important? Like if the eyes were down here and the mouth is up there, it's not human anymore, it's an alien? Exactly, yes. And it would not be able to detect that if it's only trained with like the right alignment. So yeah, yeah, that's an issue. Is, 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 is there something that is able to take in spatial positions or? In which way, what do you mean? Is there, or is there like a type of CNN that is also able to take in where in the picture uh, thing where it is, this is kind of the translation invariant. So that is already captured by the CNN. But if you want to have like the rotational invariance or something like that, I would use the um, I would use data augmentation. I think I would just take the rotated images and train on on those as well. So basically, just use more training data and cover pretty much every scenario that I want to cover. But the problem would also be that you pretty much have to you know turn by a degree. You can't just use you know 90, 90, 90. You have to actually. You would Most likely, data. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, sometimes this is what we want because we don't have that much training data, and we're actually happy that we can use techniques like that. Sometimes it's so large that it will actually become a sum. True, depends on the scenario. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so. What we see here is uh, we have actually two of those filters. So this is filter one with the weights for each filter channel and this is filter two. And basically the amount of convolution filters that I define at this layer define the number of feature channels that I get out because this is the result from this kernel here and that is the result from this one here. And these are basically independent. They could compute different things. And this is also what I use so I can basically in one layer say I want to have 64 of those kernels and they will learn to do slightly different things. Some might see lines, some might see certain points or whatever, like basic features, and then it gets abstracted more and more later down the line. So um, in terms of sizes, there's a nice little formula that you can use. So if you have some input size, some input dimensionality, and you want to have some specific output size, you can set these kernel parameters. And I completely forgot about padding and stride. This is important, so let me go back to that. So um, one thing I talked about was you need to define the size of the kernel. That's maybe the most essential property. What you also need to define is the padding. Padding means how many layers of zeros you lay around the uh, input that you have. And you're doing this to basically have the option to place a kernel here in the corner to incorporate only these edge values. Okay? If you wouldn't do any padding, you would have to place it like a free by free kernel, you have to place it here. There's another way to, to put it further to the left. Okay? And this is simply to, to incorporate more edge information. So this is the padding, and the other parameter we need to define is the stride. And the stride means how many positions we skip. Often the stride is just one, that means we're taking every possible position where we can place the kernel, but the stride could also be two, for example, so I'm just positioning it at every, every second pixel. Okay? Why would you do this? Because that, then we really miss out, actually. Well, it depends. You're not really missing out. Um, if, you, if you set the parameters correctly, let's say three by three, if you do a stride of two, then you would not miss out completely any value. Yeah? But you're not covering them in, in the way you could. Well, the, the reason for that is simply you want to enforce certain output sizes. That's the point, because you control how big your output feature map is with the stride parameter. Basically, a stride by two uh, means you basically half it. Right? So, and sometimes this is what we want. Um, I mean, if you recall in these early CNNs here, 
Uh, this is actually part of the process where you scale them down, you create more and more feature maps, but all the feature maps are going to shrink, usually by a factor of two. This is not necessarily what we do anymore in deep learning. Um, oftentimes, especially now in biological applications, we want to conserve the input size. For example, I'm not sure who was in Proto Prediction 1 in the summer. I gave a talk about contact prediction there, and there actually the input and the output dimensionality is exactly the same. So we have an L by L input, and we want to create an L by L output. So there's no, no, there's no reason to actually scale it down. So we want to conserve the size, and as you can see, there are some parameter combinations for, this, uh, for which this works. So for example, kernel size 5 by 5, then you need a padding of 2 and a stride by 1, and if you plug it in there, you see the output size is actually the same as the input size. So this is a very popular choice of, of kernel parameters here. Now, the issue with these convolution kernels is they are always rectangular, and we expect that the data they operate on are on a grid. So they have a certain topology, we are using that feature. So it's kind of a problem and we'll see in graph convolutions how we can generalize this concept to, can, to basically arbitrary topologies. So how do you actually build a deep learning system then? So as I said, we're not only having one layer of convolutions, we're usually stacking multiples. And this is not just a convolution operation, but rather a block like this. So we have uh, the convolution kernel, just like I explained. Then we usually have a batch normalization layer. This is mostly for numerical stability and for the gradient backpropagation in deep architectures. And of course, we have some nonlinear activation function, otherwise, where would be the point? Uh, in this example, it's prelude, could be anything else, could be relu, sigmoid, 10h, uh, whatever there is. What you do then, you, well, you stack many of those. So this is one example architecture I used for contact prediction. So oftentimes you have some kind of input part where you have convolution layers which simply bring down the number of feature channels, which was important in that scenario. Then you have um, the stacked layers of convolution kernels which do the actual work, the abstraction work. In this case, for example, 5x5 five five convolutions with 64 feature maps. And essentially the number of these blocks that you um, use becomes a hyperparameter. So you have to just evaluate in your scenario how many do I need? Can I get away with just one or two, or do I need a very deep architecture to actually solve that problem? Um, another popular architecture in general is the outer encoder. This has been around for quite a few years and it's still very active. Yes? Um, before we get away from seeing there's just a couple yeah. of general questions that I've had yeah. years. Why does everybody always, uh, or that's a bad statement, but often you see that people kind of uh, scale their pictures to all be like 256 by 256. Hmm. Uh, the point of a CNN is that it's input agnostic, right? Because you have your kernel size and yeah. the kernel size learns just its 3x3 three three weights and wherever you put it, it should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you always just keep your images in their default format? Just Many do that. I mean, if you do like something where the output is actually equal to the input size, then it doesn't really matter. You can use the same network, the same kernels on different image sizes. And many people do that. Um, for some which don't, there could be multiple reasons. One reason might be they are maybe doing classification. Well, yeah, and they have a I'm set amount of classes they're trying to predict. Isn't doing a classification? Yeah. Then you have the problem you need an architecture that kind of boils the input size down to a fixed size, your number of classes, for example. And then it can become cumbersome if you have dynamic input sizes. There are ways around that, but I think especially earlier on, like like a few years ago, this was kind of kind of difficult to do. You could use global average pooling nowadays, but it's 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 a bit of a hassle. This is one reason. The other reason would be more of a practical reason. Usually, you don't want to push one image through at a time or one input in the general case through at a time because it would be way too slow. What you're doing is you create mini batches. Okay, so you put like let's say a hundred of those through at a time. And there it also would be cumbersome if you have different input sizes. You would either have to use some kind of padding and basically blow every image up to the largest one you have in your batch mm -hmm. or something else, or you would actually need to go back to just pushing one through, but this is, this is not a good idea in terms of speed and sometimes also not in terms of stability. So that might be one reason. So, so what's the recommended way to do it? Like the way I did it was I picked a value 724 by 724 or something like that that was more in the middle of the range of images that I was receiving. I basically padded all of them to squares with white spaces on left, right, top, bottom mm -hmm. to kind of center the image mm -hmm. and then just scaled it either up or down. To the yeah, you can do that. When you're working with images, this is kind of natural because scaling doesn't get rid of too much information, but it depends on what you have. If you, if you have like a contact map or a distance map in, in a bioinformatics scenario, you don't want to do any scaling. 
Right. right. So um, it was like images with chemical formulas. Mm -hmm. But what that's what that kind of gets into the thing. Then what I was asking before is if you scale too much or too little, mm -hmm. be able to recognize, or that the the chronos wouldn't be able to learn something that works for all images because some yeah be so yeah true. Some would be so small. Some would be so. Big. Yeah. Did you have some extreme cases where you had scenarios like that where you really blew something up because of the scaling that you did? Mm -hmm. Kind of, I mean, the zooms were also different in some of the images that I received, mm. which made it a little bit weird, like, some of them were standardized, I, so I had, like, a data set of, like, 5,600 images that were standardized at the same zoom, mm. kind of, but of different images, just because some chemical formulas are huge and some are smaller. Yeah. Um, and so there I have the problem that I'm going to automatically blow them up or make them smaller, because mm. mm. you have this huge formula that's, like, 1,500 pixels by 1,500 mm. structure, that you want to get down to 724 by 724, so that makes it really small. And you have some very, very small ones that are only 200 by 200 pixels, and that you blow up. Yeah. Especially blowing up would be the bigger problem, I guess, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then I got some other hand drawn structures that were then super zoomed in and some mm -hmm. super zoomed out, so it was a, literally a little bit better. Thing yeah, yeah. 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 So I don't know, what, 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 what do you think would, would work well there? Or? If the scaling is too extreme, I don't think it would work well. So, so there is more important to keep the scaling constant and try to find a way around the varying image sizes? Yeah, I would rather do it like that. I mean, uh, were the original files in your case kind of at the same scaling and you just blew it up because of the size you wanted to have for the input? Yeah. Yeah. So I would rather have a system where you do not do any scaling actually as a pre-processing step and just train on the originals basically and deal with the dynamic sizes in some way. Yeah. I think this would be better. Yeah. yeah, we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. Um, sure. Yes. To that slide, like at the right side, mm -hmm. the one by one convolutional layer, mm -hmm. like what's the purpose of that? Because I imagine it is like you have like one number and like you like can't really learn anything because you're only looking at like one pixel. You're looking at one pixel, but you're also looking at the full depth. So if you have an input with, let's say, L times L and 512 feature channels, then it's just a one-by-one one convolution in the width and height dimension, but you're looking at the full 512 values in the depth dimension. And you have parameters for all of those. So basically, what these are meant for are mostly feature compression layers. So the, the deal here with these uh, contact predictions is that the input has lots of feature channels, and this becomes a burden for the memory. So what I do there is simply I'm scaling down the number of feature channels, and I'm doing this parameterized in that way with these convolutions. It's just one by one, essentially like a linear combination of all these uh, features in the depth dimension and I just push them into a smaller number. That's what I do. I simply compress it down. <laughs> and kind of the same thing here. So this is just the output layer basically. I'm just going to one channel here for binary contacts for example. Well, so it's the last layer. That's the last one, yeah. It goes from, from top to bottom, yeah. yeah. Other questions regarding that? Okay. So to autoencoders. Um, autoencoders are quite a popular co popular concept in deep learning. They've been around for many, yeah, multiple years. I think they were kind of one of the first deep architectures, and they're still used nowadays, which is pretty cool. So the general setup is always the same. You basically have an input layer here with an encoder part. This is the first half of the network. You're going to some latent space representation here in the middle. And then you kind of have a symmetric, like a mirror image of the encoder part here, which is called the decoder. And usually these default autoencoders are trained to reproduce their input. So the output is going to be the same as the input. That seems weird. Why would you do that? Well, we do that to obtain a latent space representation that we can use for something else. So we're hoping that we can do, for example, dimensionality reduction in a smart way with such a system and then use these latent space representations to train something else like a contact predictor or a signal structure predictor. And we hope that these representations are compact and good enough for that task so we're not feeding in like just one hot encoded amino acid sequence or something like that. Now, um, the important part about this hidden layer is that it's actually smaller than the original input and output. Can you imagine why? Yeah? Could those features would distinguish your data set. 
um, so which are essential for the reconstruction, which you can't get rid of. Yeah, yeah, that's going in the right direction, but what would happen if I would choose a hidden hidden size which is equal to the input size and output size? What what could happen? And what would most likely happen? Yeah. I mean it would we'll just keep it exactly the same. Yeah, exactly, yes. Produce the image again and say, okay, I just it. it would approximate the identity function essentially. Yeah. So it's gonna just push the input through and that's it, because that's the easiest way to do it for the network. And it's usually converging to the easiest way. So that wouldn't work. So we actually need to make it smaller. This is also why you see this kind of compression here in these illustrations of autoencoders. So this needs to be more compact to actually lead to a dimensionality reduction. So this is one reason why we could use it. We could just compress data. We could uh, get embeddings, like better representations for whatever we are training on. Um, but then also people thought, well, let's say we're training on images of cats again. Let's keep to that example because it's visual. And, and obtaining some hidden space representations of these cat images. Now, wouldn't it be possible to kind of throw away the encoder after the training and sample something from the space and generate a random image of a cat? So people tried that and it didn't work at all. <laughs> the problem is it didn't work because we have no idea of this latent space structure. I have no idea how to actually sample from that. Well, then came smart people and invented what is the variational autoencoder. Actually, the mathematical foundations are quite different from, from the general autoencoder, but the abstract idea is still the same. So we're training this thing. The only thing that is different here, from the high-level perspective at least, is that we enforce a structure on this latent space. We actually force the network to model a probability distribution, or let's say a distribution in general. When we have a distribution with like mean and standard deviation or something, then we can actually sample from that in a good way. And now we can suddenly generate something. So we train this thing, we throw away the encoder, and then we sample from the distribution and actually generate new images out of that. That's pretty cool. So this is one of the early generative models before generative adversarial networks and other more sophisticated techniques came up. Images were usually a bit blurry when you used that, but it was pretty cool. It was kind of the first scenario like that. Um, then there's another variant, the denoising autoencoder which is kind of the same as the default one, only that we add noise in the encoder part. Any idea why we would do that? Why should we add noise? Yeah, essentially that's the idea. And this is especially useful for practical applications like in biology where our data is inherently noisy. There's always going to be noise in there and we cannot get rid of that. But we want to make sure that the network doesn't zoom in on that noise. It shouldn't learn the noise. So by introducing a bit of variation in the encoder part, we could actually make the network more robust to these changes and it wouldn't overfit too much on, on noisy stuff. So this is kind of the idea. But what we also want to do in the decoder part, we still want to reconstruct the original input, right? So it has to kind of learn how to filter out that noise, and this is quite useful in many applications. Kind of an extension of that are ladder networks. Ladder networks are denoising autoencoders. We're just doing one additional thing. We're kind of branching out from here, from this latent space, because if I just use the autoencoder, it's essentially unsupervised training, okay? We do not really have a loss here. Yeah. With the noise, so we are actually hoping that the network kind of finds out what kind of noise we added and then takes it out. So we kind of hope for that. Did I understand this correctly? Yeah, and we hope that it's also able to filter out the experimental noise that's inherent in the data at the same time. So it becomes robust enough to really find a good signal in the data, no matter if there's a little bit of variation in there. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of the core idea. So this is unsupervised training if you're just using the autoencoder, right? But we could also say, well, if we could add some kind of loss, like domain-specific loss, it might lead to better representations that we can use for other prediction tasks. And this is kind of the idea of the ladder network. So this is kind of a plain autoencoder, or rather a denoising autoencoder, sorry. And then we're branching out from this latent space and we're actually trying to do, let's say, secondary structure prediction based on this embedding in there. And we train this jointly. So we're doing the unsupervised training for all the samples for which we do not have secondary structure, for example. But for the ones where we know the structure, we also introduce the supervised loss. So we kind of have a semi-supervised setting. And we're hoping that by doing that, we enforce that the, the overall structure of this latent space carries more biologically meaningful information. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's a good, good way to try. 
actually what we do nowadays, and I think you've heard about that, um, this is from our group. So Michael Einzinger and Ahmed El Nagar introduced these ELMO embeddings. Um, this is a concept borrowed from natural language processing, so a completely different area of deep learning. And essentially what these systems try to do, at least in the language domain, they try to predict the next word in a sentence, given all the previous words. Or if you do it from a backward direction, basically the previous word given all, this, all the ones that follow. Okay, and we obtain, when we, when we train the system, we then obtain very high quality representations of the words that we put in, or rather the, the sentences that we put in. And we can kind of do the same thing with, uh, uh, with our biological domain. Okay, we can train this on a corpus of biosequences, protein sequences, and we're trying to predict the next residue type, or the previous res residue type in the backward direction. Okay. We're doing this with these LSTMs, and in the end we can obtain a representation for a protein which ideally captures a lot of the information of it. And then we're using that for other prediction tasks as like a sequence feature input. So back to classical CNNs. So nowadays um, this is kind of the standard way to, to do things with 2D CNNs which are residual networks. So they kind of work like uh, the traditional ones, so again this is from, from top to bottom, but we have another layer of abstraction in there basically, so we are stacking these residual blocks. And each residual block looks like that. So each residual block contains convolution layers, this can be an arbitrary number of convolutions, so in this case it's two, but it could be one, it could be three, it could be more. This is another hyperparameter essentially. Um, but the trick here, the, the core idea is that we're feeding the input of that block through and add it to the output. And we're doing this with the next block as well. The motivation behind that is that we want to make these lower abstraction layers available for the later stages as well. Otherwise we would just abstract and abstract and abstract and in the end we only have the abstracted information. And now through, through these shortcuts here, we are also giving the network the ability to look at the less abstracted stuff at the same time. We're adding this up all the way, all these residual blocks, and this is much more powerful than just using a straight linear way of setting up these blocks. So this is basically what all people do now. So when someone does something with 2D convolutions, they're usually using residual networks because it's always better than not using them. So this is kind of the, the gold standard right now. Yes? In this app, is this really just an ad or do they do some LSTM-like tricks where they weight this stuff? It is actually just adding them up. Yeah, you add the two tensors, which also has the benefit that you're not changing the size. It's going to stay the same. Because otherwise, this is, this is actually a technique from another kind of network. Um, briefly, there were dense networks, which were kind of a rivaling technology to residual networks. In this case, you didn't add, but you concatenated. So you had a tensor of double the size in the end. This was problematic because then your tensors grow all the time. They get larger and larger, and then you have to restrict the number of feature channels so it actually fits into memory and becomes a bit of a hassle. So um, in this case, it's really just adding up. But this doesn't really matter because you are backpropagating through that. And so you're backpropagating through the addition, so it's going to branch out anyway when, when the gradient flows backwards. So you're not really losing too much information. It's not that bad. Even though it seems you're kind of mixing them together, but that's, that doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, so let's get to graph convolutions. So the whole motivation behind this is now to get away from this rectangular feature uh, filter kernels that you use and kind of um, find ways to use similar ideas on arbitrary topologies, basically. So on arbitrary graphs. Because as you can see here, so this is kind of a, a small toy graph here. Graph is usually defined by a number of vertices or nodes or whatever you want to call them and edges or connections relations, whatever. So this is an arbitrary graph, but you can of course interpret a grid structure like those here. You could use a standard CNN on this, but this is also a graph. Okay, so in theory you could apply a graph convolutional network on that. Actually you would need to include the diagnosis way as well to, to really get a rectangular area, but it maps to that. So this also shows immediately that graph convolutions are a generalization of the normal convolutions and you can go back to standard 2D convolutions using the same technique. So there are different kinds of graphs. Um, we are mostly looking at undirected graphs, which means that the relation is symmetric. So if one node is connected to another, it also means this other node is connected to the original one. Okay? 
Now, what we can uh, get out of this is an adjacency matrix that capture, captures the structure of the graph. So an adjacency matrix simply has a one in there if two nodes are connected to each other and a zero if not. And uh, you see the diagonal is zero, so we're not including self-connections. Now this thing is symmetric for an undirected graph because the relation is symmetric, obviously. So one node, is, if A is connected to C, then C is also connected to A. Right? Um, then the term degree should be familiar to you. Um, the degree is just the number of connections that a node has. And you can obtain that from the adjacency matrix simply by summing up rows or columns. In this case, it doesn't matter. So in this case here, A has a degree of five. As you can see, it has five connections. Now, if we go to a directed graph, the story is a bit more complicated because now the relation is no longer symmetric, which also means the adjacency matrix is no longer symmetric. Uh, this is kind of a special case here in, in this one here because it's uh, non-cyclical. If we had a cycle, we would also have uh, one in the lower triangle here. But anyway, um, and now you have to differentiate with the degrees because now you have out degrees and in degrees. It's not the same anymore. But we're not going to talk too much about directed graphs in this, this uh, scenario here. Um, but briefly, just to mention that there are also weighted graphs, obviously, in this case, uh, uh, without any directions. Um, in this case, the adjacency matrix is symmetric again, but it's not binary anymore. We're just having the weights in there instead. So one very important thing about graphs, and uh, very important in graph theory in general, is the graph Laplacian. You might have heard Laplacian in other contexts, like maybe physics, engineering, or something like that, um, like the sum of partial derivatives or something, and it's usually used to smoothly propagate something in a field, yeah, roughly speaking. Um, and it's kind of the same idea for graphs as well. It's mostly used to uh, well, describe the graph. There are many interesting properties about the graph Laplacian. And you can also use it in many scenarios to kind of propagate information through edges of a network. And this is also the underlying idea for these graph convolutions. And we, we will get to that. Now, the graph Laplacian mathematically is defined as the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. When I say degree matrix, this is just a diagonal matrix with the degrees on the diagonal and zero every, everywhere else and the adjacency matrix as defined uh, in the last slide. So as I said, it's gonna be the degree on the diagonal and otherwise off the diagonal it's either minus one in this case because we subtract if these nodes are actually connected and zero otherwise. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, just to introduce it as well, because we'll need it, um, there's the uh, normalized symmetric Laplacian, which is defined a little bit more sophisticated here. So this is either defined on the uh, default Laplacian like that, or like uh, a difference from the identity matrix when we're using the original adjacency matrix. And we'll have entries in the form of that. So um, I introduced that simply because it has interesting properties, which we will use when we're now going into the math behind the graph convolutions. So this is just an example, so you see what a graph Laplacian looks like in this case. So you can see the node degrees here on the diagonal, and then you see the minus one for connections and zeros where we do not have any connections. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the row and column sums are always zero. Makes sense, right? There are other interesting properties, like the eigenvalues are all positive. That's also one thing. And this is also quite important. So now we're getting into some math. <laughs> so the whole motivation behind this part is really to get to a nice and easy formulation that we can actually use in deep learning frameworks. Because now if you're going into eigen decomposition and stuff like that, this is something you don't want to do when you're training a big neural network. So the whole motivation is to go from something which is quite complex um, and might not be familiar to everyone, but in the end we get to something which is basically just matrix multiplication. And this is something we can parallelize, we can implement in PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever. So bear with me, it's a couple of slides with a bit of math. So, uh, it's everything about spectral graph convolution. Spectral graph convolution is defined like that, so this is the convolution operation, and this is how it is defined. So we're having some function parameterized by theta, and this is all based here on the eigenvalue decomposition. You might remember that from linear algebra at some point. Um, we do not really care too much about, uh, about that formulation. What is important is this here is a function of the eigenvalues. The problem is these eigenvalue decompositions are very computationally expensive when we have very large graphs. And we might have very large graphs with like tens of thousands of nodes and even more connections with high node degrees. So we don't want to compute that really. So we're going to an approximation pretty much immediately. So in this paper, you can look up the details. 
I was introduced that you can approach this function by using Chebyshev polynomials. So this is roughly a sum of these polynomials here. Um, it doesn't really matter how they are defined because, uh, as you will see in a second, we will use a neat trick and basically eliminate most of them. But they are defined recursively. So basically Tn is something like something times Tn minus 1 plus something times Tn uh, minus 2, something like that. And then you have some initial conditions. So T0 is always going to be 1, no matter the input. And T1 is always going to be the input that you put in. And this is actually the only thing we need, as you will see in a second. So if we put this in into our uh, signal convolution formula, we get something like that, which looks quite complicated. And this is actually now uh, modeling the neighborhood of the nodes. So it's the kth degree neighborhood that we're looking at. And now to simplify things um, in a form that we can actually use it in a deep learning framework, we simply set this big K to one. Just plain out one. We're only caring about the one degree neighborhood. And then the whole thing simplifies quite significantly. So when we set k to 1, we only have um, two things in our sum because we're only uh, going through 0 and 1 as indices. And because of the properties of this Chebyshev polynomials, we get to a formulation like that, which is already much more handleable. We also make the assumption that the maximum eigenvalue is roughly 2. This is just a scaling operation. Don't care too much about that. The neural network parameters adapt for that. So you can even simplify more and say, well, OK, I don't want to have two different parameters. We're setting just one as the additive inverse. And then we can pull that out and get something like this. And this looks much, much more easier to handle in a computer. Now, um, this is slightly numerically unstable. This is simply the reason for this last transformation that we do here. Um, but this makes it even a bit more approachable here. So again, A is just this A uh, here is just the adjacency matrix plus the identity matrix. And then we have this modified degree matrix, which simply sums up over this modified adjacency matrix. So you compute that matrix, and then that's it. Then you have your parameter and your original input, and this is how you compute it. Now, in actual neural network terms, it would look like that. So if we generalize this to an input with an arbitrary number of feature channels, so we have n nodes in our graph with c associated features, some node properties. So c are the input channels in uh, deep learning terminology. And we want to have f feature maps in the output of that. Then we're having a computation like that. So our z, before we go into the nonlinearity, for example, is computed with this big matrix, and we can pre-compute that, okay? Because this depends just on the graph structure, so all we do is once we pre-compute this matrix, and all we have to do is now we multiply this matrix with our input features and our weight matrix, which are of convenient sizes here, and we get our output out. That's it. So a lot of math and a lot of simplification to get to this. So if we phrase it even in more deep learning familiar terms, um, if we have some activations, some, some hidden states in layer L, and we want to know how do we get to layer L plus 1, kind of the same thing as you would do with just normal neural networks. Well, the same thing. You compute this matrix, or you rather pre-compute this matrix, apply it to your previous layer activations, multiply with your weight matrix, apply some nonlinearity, sigmoid, relu, whatever, and you get your next node representation out. That's it. So this is pretty cool. So in PyTorch, or maybe even TensorFlow, I'm not familiar with that, you would actually write something like this. This is all. So in, in a normal neural network, you would maybe have a conf2d here. And in this case, it's just a GCN layer. And there are actually implementations for graph um, convolutions in most of the big frameworks, as far as I know. So it really just looks like that. You have your node features. You have an adjacency matrix. This is what you throw in. And you get your next um, hidden representation out. That's it. Now the point is. These graph convolution layers, the way we define it, or the way we simplify it, only look at the first degree neighborhood, so only at the direct neighbors of nodes. But the cool property is just in the same way, kind of, yeah, it's, it's analogous to, to the normal CNNs. If you stack multiple of those layers, you kind of get a bigger receptive field. It's the same here. So if you're using two of those layers, then you're basically in total looking at the third degree neighborhood, so incorporating three edges from each node. So that's kind of handy. The more you use, the, the deeper you go in your network. So how to actually apply that now in biology? What can we do with this? So the first thing I thought about was, or I really jumped on that because I was doing contact prediction earlier. And I thought, OK, contact maps are essentially adjacency matrices. So if we interpret a protein like a graph, and we say nodes, like residues, are connected when they are in close proximity, then this is exactly the adjacency matrix. 
Well, with the difference that in, in the contact map we have these self connections, so the diagonal, but this is the only minor difference, okay? Otherwise, this is an adjacency matrix. And the distance map here, which carries more information, obviously, is even better. And this is kind of a representation of a weighted graph, right? So it's not binary, we have no weighted connections, but it still maps very well to this. So I thought, okay, maybe we can use some kind of sequence features, could be just amino acid sequence, uh, one hot encoded, could be something like ELMO embeddings. And then together with this adjacency matrix, we could easily predict something like function of proteins. Right? Sounds great. There's even a paper that tries to do exactly that. Um, this is not peer-reviewed, it's a bioarchive preprint from this year, but they're following exactly that idea. So this is the graph convolution part here, and as input they use um, feature representations which are kind of like ELMO embeddings, it's kind of the same thing. So this is what we would do externally beforehand as a pre-processing thing, but they're using the same idea. They have stacked LSTMs, they predict the next residue, they get some representation out, so this is what their sequence input is. And then they're using contact maps as the adjacency matrix. Throw that in, do three layers of GCN, go into some fully connected layers, and then classification with Go terms in this example. So it sounds great, and I really thought, okay, this is an approach, I need to try that. This was actually the original motivation for the full lecture for today. It's actually getting a bit longer than I thought, so it's almost a full lecture. <laughs> but this approach actually does not work, what? not at all. It doesn't work. The problem is, you didn't pay attention when you did the math part, right? <laughs> no, I don't blame you. Um, I actually discovered this much later on in a review paper that talked about that. And here it says, well, in all of these spectral approaches, the problem is the learned filters depend on the Laplacian eigenbasis, which depends on the graph structure. That means you have th th this, this whole formulation depends on a fixed graph structure. You cannot say you throw in proteins like graphs, like different graphs all the time, because it's not going to learn anything reasonable. Okay, you can only use these systems on one big static graph. This is what you can do, but you cannot train on proteins like that. This is maybe also the reason why this hasn't been published yet, because it will not get through peer review. And uh, this was kind of the big issue because I trusted that a little bit too much and thought it would be a viable approach, and it's not. That doesn't mean that you cannot use it at all in bioinformatics, it's just you have to use it carefully. So. This is one example from another paper, it's also just a preprint, sadly, but this one uses it correctly, okay? So they are doing many things, they're also including relation networks, I'm not going to go into detail of that. Um, the important part is what they use for these graph convolutions is a big protein-protein interaction network. And this is one network and it stays the same, no matter what the other inputs are, okay? It's one static network, which also means you can compute this kind of Laplacian term, pre-compute that matrix and you're done, and you use it for, for this fixed graph, and that works. But you cannot use it for multiple graphs in the system, you cannot train on different graphs. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. For that you would need other approaches, there are other ways to do graph convolutions, but at least the spectral approaches do not work for that. So, yeah, I think for PPI it's pretty interesting, for other prediction scenarios it's not, so... Yes. So when, they, so when you say the graph needs to stay the same, does that mean nodes and connections and edges and everything? Yes, that needs so, to be static. So what does it predict in the end? Uh, what you can do is, and what most people do is, uh, kind of semi-supervised training. So you're having a graph, I don't think they use it that way, there are multiple ways to do it, but the standard way, which was also the motivation for the original machine learning paper, was to train on a graph of partial annotations. So you have node features for some nodes, but not for all. And what you're basically trying to do is to predict the features, the node features for the missing nodes, for which you don't have those. And you kind of do this by propagating the information from the nodes where you have information through this network, through these graph convolution layers, this is what they do, and then you can infer with the right weights, this way you train it, what kind of features do these other nodes have for which I do not have the annotation. That's the idea. I talk about data visualization and um, presentation, and this has to do at times with, uh, well, it has mostly to do with the fact, especially the first couple of slides, uh, that when people come and present at lab meetings, for our lab meetings, um, I am a very visual person, um, which is sort of like represented by this as well. If I think about how I present myself, I like to do it with a combination of images and data. Um, so I'm a little bit all over the place. Um, and if I see how other people approach this uh, during lab meetings, which are maybe more oriented towards the science, I don't know, um, then they, in my opinion, sometimes uh, start to forget about what makes sense visually. Uh, and actually, visual science is a science. Design is not an opinion. 
um, as some people might tell you. Uh, but if you want to know more about that, then you should study it. Um, okay, let's start with an example. If you have a table of profits uh, for the year 2019, this tells you something, but you might sort of like not be super keen on reading this and this might give you maybe a more interesting approach towards your problem. Uh, and this is yet another representation of the same data in a different way. Yet, if I were to ask you which one would you go for if you had to put them in a slide, what would you choose? So let's go for table. Who would choose the table? Show of hands. Who would choose the um, pie chart? Who would choose the... So you see that there's no... Th this is empirical science, so you all sort of like... Uh, um, chose that one, which is a little bit cheating because obviously pie charts are great to represent data which uh, amounts to 100 because you can represent um, proportions better. Um, so maybe if you had something which you know amounts to 100, you want to show it with, with a pie chart. But in general, I would uh, suggest, uh, highly suggest everyone to never use pie charts because human brains are just wired in a way which does not allow us to distinguish between angles. So you do know that maybe these are, it's few enough data so that you can visually see that this is bigger than this one, but at a certain distance and with enough different classes, you would actually never be able to tell which class is bigger and which class is smaller. So just don't use pie charts, um, they're bad bad invention and even worse if they are in 3D, but I'm gonna get there. Uh, so these are this, the same graph. Can someone tell me what they see? Anyone? Sort of like interpret the difference between the two graphs. Go ahead. Well, they suggest that the data is based in different categories. For example, what you had a month, but as a month is the same thing, I would use the right one because I don't want to convey any difference between Month, That's exactly right. So previously when I gave this, could you turn off the lights, uh, just the front ones, it, which is the top one I think? Uh, yeah, okay. So whenever you have color in graph, the immediate association uh, of the human brain uh, is that um, there is some meaning to it. So why would you put color if there's no meaning behind it? Just avoid putting colors if you don't have a specific reason as to why. Um, you're gonna put the color. And now, does someone have an interpre interpretation for these two figures? Um, anyone? Fast, quickly? Yes? And we have the problem that the, it looks the same, but the y-axis is still different. That's a very good observation. That's exactly correct. Um, so it depends. You, this might actually not be wrong. This might not be something that uh, was done on purpose. So you might want to show that the distribution is identical between the two years. But you might want to add a note that there's a 10% loss uh, between, be yes, between year one and year two. And this is important because when you start reading papers or scientific anything or presentations, uh, people voluntarily or involuntarily are going to make these mistakes. Um, and uh, sometimes you could also see, I mean in this case it's, it's great because maybe you, the thing that you're interested in, in is really just the, the distribution, right? Uh, but in other cases uh, this might be comp completely confusing and we had a case of that just like four weeks ago uh, in one of the presentations. Now this one is another one which I adore. Um, can anyone tell me what they see? Just read, read the graph um, and tell me something about it. Linear regressions. And mm -hmm. yeah, they're differently colored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a difference between the two? One might have a different R squared value than the other. Okay. Um, Okay, so from a perspective of uh, human readability, this is very bad for 20% of the human population because it's uh, green, uh, green and red. Um, so never ever use green and red. Just think about whatever you do when you see green and red, just avoid them as like a cancer. Uh, and the other thing is you had no error bars in the, in, the, in the graph, which if this was some evaluation of some model, for example, you would want to have. And in error uh, graphs, this uh, error bars, these graphs are completely identical. There's no distinguish, uh, distinction between the two data sets. So, um, yeah, you could also just not color them differently. I mean, this might be two different measures, but in error, gra in error um, 
estimates they are the same. So yeah, this is important. Uh, this I pulled from the web, otherwise I would have never put the red line, but um, this just shows you that if you use, you should use different um, uh, cumulative metrics for um, uh, evaluating your data sets. So in this specific case, if you just look at the Pearson's R, it's almost identical between the four data sets, although uh, the distributions are very different. Um, Sperman's uh, row has uh, better sensitivity in this case. So uh, what this is basically, what this, the message of this is, is uh, don't limit yourself to you know, looking at one measure and then be happy with that measure. Uh, if that measure correlates with your theory and your uh, hypothesis, because um, it could just be that the measure uh, is, is not really capturing something in the data which you are not uh, understanding, especially in research. Um, okay, so I actually went through this very quickly, uh, way quicker than before. Um, are there any questions about uh, any of this up until now? It's just like basically um, things that I've seen done over and over again. Could you explain the one with the standard errors again? I didn't. Well, why are they the same data? Because the standard errors overlap. Yes. So, so there is a case where you can draw one line through both data sets. Well, I mean, the, the line which you see is a, is a tendency line, and the tendency line is built on the measurement. The measurement, uh, the tendency line does not account for, for the standard error. So if you were to draw um, the um, tendency line with the standard error, the line on the graph would occupy more space. It would be like a support vector machine and a support vector. So you would have like blue one and then blue two and blue three. And so you, you, the entire, the tennis line would actually be the entire line um, segment. I mean, it's more like an area. Uh, so if the two areas intersect for the entirety of, you know, their, um, let's say, um, whatever, data collection thingy, uh, then it's basically the same thing. So that's why we have this error estimates. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's um, tempting to think as a human that they are different and even if, if they overlap, but they don't overlap one to one, they're still different, but they're not. That's why we have this error estimate. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Okay, so, um, okay, I might go a little bit more into details of colors here. Uh, so I was working with this guy in Singapore who is now sitting in Shenzhen, uh, between Shenzhen and Singapore actually, uh, and he so co-authored um, a new experimental technique which um, does the melt home of, uh, of cells. So he basically gets out the melting curve behavior of proteins in cell lines, um, which is kind of cool because they, um, you can do that as a protein level versus if you do expression data, it's done at a RNA level, right? Um, I don't know how much you are into the experimental stuff, but that's a thing. Um, the, it's, um, interestingly, uh, the, the example that I have chosen here uh, is green and red. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that um, the system that I developed in first color from um, the um, protein name and the experiment. Uh, so these are two different experiments, E1 and E2. And then there's uh, uniproduct session identifiers for both of the proteins. So there's no really a uh, way that I can change the color manually. And the reason why I colored them this way is because you might want to have multiple experiments for the same protein and still the color being slightly similar. Um, and you want proteins to be different between different proteins. So different uh, uniprot identifiers have clearly different colors. Um, another uh, thing to notice here is uh, this is a classic, uh, it's a good example of why you, want, um, like why you want to show different metrics and why you want to show different representation of the same data. This is exactly the same data, just in one form. We actually see temperature in Celsius and then on the y-axis you see how much of the protein is not denatured at that temperature. So at 38, which is physiological, you see most of the protein still being alive. And then while you traverse the temperature uh, upwards, the, the proteins become denatured. Uh, I think maybe P82970 might be a heat shock protein because it survives pretty well um, different heats. Uh, but here you can already see the behavior of, of the two proteins is consistent uh, within experiments and different between proteins. 
Um, and this is also something that you see from the graph representation over there, where the graph representation is basically taking into account all of the 10 measurements that we have of temperature, and then um, it builds this graph based on uh, repulsion or attraction uh, of Euclidean distance between the vectors that are formed by the two proteins. So the two proteins which are in the same experiment, uh, sorry, the two same proteins in the different experiments are gonna have similar behaviors, so they're close in space, form a cluster and then the two um, other ones um, are apart and also form a cluster. And just to give an example of this, on the fly, which because we added more things, um, is for example this one. Oops. Okay, um, so basically it's the same thing that I just showed you, right? Um, but here you can see it, there's no real difference between any of the curves in this um, in this specific selections. So it, between these proteins, why is that? Because the assumption is that proteins that are in contact when this uh, experiment is laid out are gonna have a similar pattern in in terms of their melting behavior, and this is consistent with with what you can see here. Uh, although there might be some ex exceptions for, for example, this curve or this curve and it's you know you if you want to become more sensitive what can you do well you can use different um, metrics for the distance for example in the graph and this would then throw out this uh, yellowish protein over here uh, which is this one um, and you might want to start studying that a, a little bit more and it shows you that these are um, even more in um, in context because they form a, a closer cluster uh, so this this is you know just trying to give biologists um, help in, in terms of exploring the data that they, they're looking at from an unsupervised way. So we don't know if these proteins are actually in contact uh, during the experiment, but this is what we hypothesize, right? But we also don't want to cheat, so we also show um, different type, uh, types of metrics. And um, the reason, so when I was saying the hypothesis here is that proteins that melt at a similar rate are in contact, uh, in spatial contact um, during the experiment, we actually have protein-protein interaction data. There are different databases for that. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we could show distances and protein-protein interaction data and try to see if they correlate well. Um, and that's exactly what we do here. On the left uh, part of the, of the matrix, we have annotation, annotations from uh, HIPI, which is a protein-protein interaction network. It gives you a score from zero to one, one meaning highest probability of interaction, zero meaning almost no probability. Uh, and then on the right side, we have the distances, the Euclidean distances calculated from this, um, this melting curves. And the idea here is that if the, the, the more the color gets darker, so the darker blue or the darker brown, the likelier it is that they interact. And there is some sort of a correlation for at least, the, you know, like this dark color. Uh, and even here it gets lighter, it gets lighter also over here. So there, there, there is some um, truth in the data, but uh, definitely it's, it's, it, you cannot use it as a de novo uh, prediction of protein-protein interactions, but you can use it to validate. So um, these are all visual aids that if I were just to present you with the numbers that you see in the uh, right upper score, it, it would be hard to see the global picture of how that relates to the entire thing, right? So um, yeah, it's important to think and work um, on visualizations. The next one is uh, CellMap. This is a paper, this is the first project that I ever worked on with the lab here. Um, and um, it's a paper that I'm revisiting right now for um, some venue. So uh, Tatiana Goldberg, which was a PhD student in the lab a couple of years ago, she predicted all of the localizations for human. And uh, she had a big text file where you would have the name of the protein and then just like uh, the name of the localization where the protein is localized at. And this is not really exciting, so you, it, it's much easier if you just load a bunch of proteins into some viewer and you see where the proteins are. So we thought, okay, what can we do? Uh, and the idea is basically just visualize the proteins on the image of a cell, uh, make it as customizable as possible, and also um, overlay edges between the proteins because it's interesting to gain some biological, uh, some more biological uh, understanding about what's going on. Um, and specifically why we, sh we shifted to 
to, sorry, specifically we shifted to um, visualizing protein-protein interaction in the context of subcellular localization rather than visualizing subcellular localization in the context of protein-protein interaction because we noticed that protein-protein interaction visualization is, is, is just pointless. And to give an example of that, let me show you. PEX19. So this is a protein which has 118, um, 118 interaction partners in this hippie data source, which again is a data source for protein-protein interaction. Um, and if I just show you this visualization, you gain zero biological knowledge, absolutely none. This is the actual database uh, website, and this is the actual search facility of the database. Um, versus if, you give you, if I give you something like, um, what cell map shows, it might not necessarily be much more uh, clear in terms of the entire network, but at least you can see where things locate. So you know that this uh, protein now interacts with things that are outside of the cell, it interacts with stuff that is in the nucleus, you can move it around, uh, now it's here, so I can see the network of this thing. If I start clicking on other things, I don't actually know, you can see that there's, there might be some um, um, cascade effect, so if I interact, if, if uh, this part, these two proteins are part of a pathway and one of the two proteins gets knocked out, uh, another protein might jump in in its, in its place. So there are all of these new biological um, insights that you might generate from looking at, you know, an image like this uh, overlaid with a different data. Uh, and obviously also here you kind of have to have um, facilities for people to visualize things more clearly. Uh, why is there color? Um, the color here again is dependent on the protein name. So, uh, so sorry, in this case the color is dependent on the localization. So things that are localized in the same place have the same color. It also gives you a, a clue about where things are. Um, for example, I know that this one being colored differently is probably on the, on the membrane instead of being actually in the uh, uh, peroxisome. Um, so yeah, this, this is basically just a bunch of uh, visualization tools that I have developed and they are fun and you all, you, they're not easy. So th it's not easy to just come up with this visualization. You actually have to think what is the meaning behind this. The same way you, when you develop a machine learning algorithm, have to think why am I developing uh, this machine learning algorithm? Why am I choosing a neural network over uh, a support vector machine and does it make sense? Um, Okay, last but not least is a story from um, friends. So this came from Chris Sander. Does, do you know Chris Sander? No? So Chris is a cool guy. Um, and uh, so about 40 years ago, 20, 40, between 20 and 40 years ago, he formulated this idea, which never got into doing because of uh, just mathematical limitations of models at the time, where Deborah jumped in and she um, had the mathematical understanding because she studied math. Uh, and Thomas then implemented it in uh, real life and the story is basically called EV couplings. Um, the idea behind EV couplings, uh, do you guys know about the concept of couplings in uh, um, structure determination in biology? Um, to make a long story short, you know that uh, amino acid sequences are these long chains. Um, and uh, how can you ca compute structure from this amino acid chain if you just know the sequence itself? There are a lot of uh, traditional approaches to this and Chris, Debbie, Thomas came up with an idea where basically uh, if you can just put constraints on certain positions uh, because you know that these positions are going to form a contact in, uh, in three dimensions, in three dimensional space, then this, this is going to guide you towards building the entire 3D structure of the protein. And there are actually, doesn't, there don't need to be too many of these constraints. It suffices to have a couple of them and then the rest you can sort of like simulate with just normal simulations. So um, basically what EV couplings does, it, um, it takes a, a reference sequence, the sequence that you want to fold, uh, it looks at all of neighbor, neighboring sequences in different organisms or in the past, so the evolution of the, of the sequence that you're looking at, and then it tries to compute what, what positions are conserved in the sequence, meaning that you might see many times that uh, a certain amino acid changes this at the same time that another amino acid changes, and that means that those two positions um, are coupled together in, in evolution.
So this allows you to put constraints on the sequence and then to fold it into 3D structures. Um, how do we actually visualize that? Another problem. So you obviously could just calculate the 3D structure of the proteins. Some of them make sense, some of them are completely pointless. But for some application you actually are not interested in that at all. Uh, what you rather want to do is to... Um, just give me a second. Nope, the wrong one. Uh, is to look at the... Um, to look at the actual coupling scores. So you could just visualize them as numbers, saying like position something something is coupled with other position something something at a certain threshold, but this is hard to parse. So one of the visualization that I came up with uh, on the air, on the flight to Boston was just to visualize this it like this. So you have these threads that go from, this is the amino acid sequence ordered by first to last um, um, letter in the sequence. And then you can just see these threads that go from one position to the other one. And this is interesting because what you're interested in mostly in these cases are these long range uh, contacts. So you can definitely see that there's a portion of the sequence at the beginning and a portion towards the end that are highly connected. There's an entire section of these that are connected. So most likely this is going to fold together. And then you can start folding like this and then you can start folding this other part down here and then you can start folding something in the middle. And obviously between amino acids which are ad adjacent there might be a high coupling score because they form helices or um, other um, local structures. So this is um, this is just one way of visualizing this. Um, there are many other ways, uh, for example, the contact map, uh, which uh, Constantine talked about prior, for which we might have, let me see, this one. Um, this is uh, sort of like a many layer visualization of the contact map where, can I zoom in? Yeah. Um, these are just basically these this contacts uh, at a certain threshold. So you say that, um, if the coupling score is above a certain threshold, these are just imaginary numbers you know, in your head, uh, then you say that this is going to be a contact in 3D space. And that's way, what you draw there. And then what you see in this specific representation is, um, okay, what is the sequence there? This is the sequence motif, uh, which uh, if you know uh, multiple sequence alignment, it just tells you what letters are um, likely to appear in that specific region. And then you see this uh, matrix uh, with K, R, E, Q, K, R, E, Q, uh, K, R, E, L, sorry. And these are the mutation uh, possibilities. So what happens if I mutate the sequence from K to K, um, or R to K, or E to K, or Q to K, and so on. So these are the sort of like the two most likely, the four most likely uh, changes on the L by L of the, of the sequence. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of, uh, of these uh, things. Uh, another one is, for example, the alignment itself. So the alignment is just um, the sequence, the sequences, the neighboring sequences that I was telling you about in different organisms. So you could just visualize this as text, but it wouldn't really tell you much, right? So for example, what a colleague of mine did here is uh, he uh, colored the sequences based on biophysical properties. Uh, so I think this is charge, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not entirely sure, don't quote me on this one. Um, so basically you can see that, for example, let's suppose that green is positively charged, there's a lot of positive charge there, and a lot of positive charge there, although they are conserved, uh, they might not interact in 3D space because they're positively charged. So you can start to do all of this biological or biophysical intuitions just based on what you're seeing. So you're condensing a lot of data uh, and, and color in these cases is relevant. Um, another way of seeing this is literally just not seeing the sequence at all and just seeing the colors. Uh, and then you can start you know, thinking about what does this mean. And if you are trained enough, which uh, I am not, but Chris is, he can actually start folding the sequence by just looking at, um, at these images, which is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so that's basically, that's basically it. Um, this, uh, I just wanted sort of like to give you an overview about um, visualization tools that at least I have been participating in or developed for biology in the last couple of years. Uh, and I think this is an uh, exciting and sort of like undervalued field because there's a lot of things that you can gain from visualizations.